Humans obviously have changed a lot of the world around them, and in some pretty significant ways. Ranging from things about our infrastructure or how we interact with the environment, to how we get around or work or travel, all of these things have changed exponentially over time. Even things like our food, we have changed significantly. What we eat or how we eat it, or how we cultivate what we eat. But even then, when you think of something like Brussels sprouts, or, I don't know, a banana, a watermelon, you don't think that they're unnatural, or that they're artificial. I mean artificial rings of things like plastic bottles or fake rocks, but not vegetables. But what's even more interesting to me is that so many of our changes to the food occurred as far back as the medieval times, or potentially even earlier. Things that you would think would require modern agriculture or modern science didn't, and people have been eating these foods for thousands of years because of that. I found this really interesting, so I decided to dig into it, and this is what I found. First, if you could just hit that like and subscribe button, it's free for you, and it would help me out immensely. If you could also just leave a comment for engagement, that'd be so awesome. Let's get started by talking about the difference between artificial and natural selection. Natural selection is really the baseline selective pressure. In a wordy way, natural selection is the differential survival and reproduction of individuals due to a difference in relative fitness endowed on them by their own particular complement of observable characteristics. Yes, I looked that up, obviously. One of the best examples of natural selection, though, is the peppered moth. Typically, this moth was lightly colored to blend in with lichen growing on trees. However, the Industrial Revolution began and heavy levels of black soot began coating everything in the local environment. Those lightly colored moths became very obvious to predators. However, there were some moths of that species that, because of being melanistic, they were actually black perfectly blending into the new environment, and in just a few decades, the black moths became the dominant color of the entire species. Interestingly, as pollution was reduced, and the lightly colored moths made a comeback, as they could blend into the lichens again. The most important piece of this is that natural selection really selects for reproduction. It does what it needs to do to make sure that more individuals, more moths, can exist in the future. In plants, this phenomenon is no different. Take a look at watermelons, for example. The watermelon originates from Africa, likely a region around modern-day Sudan. The plant was very small and round. It was hard. The inside was a pale, bland fruit, devoid of any real flavor or color, especially those that we now associate with the watermelon. It also had very large seeds and they were certainly not conducive to eating. Somewhere around four to 5,000 years ago, these plants were starting to be utilized by humans. Not only, well, only for the sake of containing water. I mean, you didn't have water bottles back then, so you might just carry around a handful of these quote-unquote watermelons. At this point in time, these plants were never grown for flavor, or certainly not for pool parties like they are today. This is because, after all, those things don't matter to the plant. What the humans want doesn't matter to the plant, inherently. The plant is trying to benefit itself in the natural environment. It doesn't care very much for what we want. Then enters artificial selection, which is really just natural selection, but just utilized by people to select for what humans want and not necessarily for what nature wants. Every single time an early farmer made a choice about what plants to plant, he was simultaneously choosing which traits of that plant he wanted in the next harvest. Sensibly, a lot of these farmers, at least in the case of a watermelon, picked for larger fruit, which means that they could hold more water, so they were more functionally useful to the farmers. And if the fruit also happened to taste a little better, why would you not grow that particular strain instead? All the while, these plants started to develop to that artificial pressure that the humans were applying to them. In a sense, the watermelon was okay with it because 
they were growing more and more and more. And now, they're being protected and grown by people. At this point, we're able to manipulate the watermelon to grow into bizarre shapes that they're certainly not natural. We've even adjusted them to not have seeds on certain variants. When, and when you think about it, the seed is like a core component to the plant that's a huge crucial step for them. And remember, a lot of these changes started occurring back when selective breeding was first utilized four, five, potentially even 6,000 years ago. It doesn't require modern technology, and that kind of begged the question to me. What other foods have we really messed with? Have we done anything so crazy to just create new foods altogether back before any of the modern science or agriculture was here? Actually, yeah, we have. Some common food items we eat routinely have never and will never ever exist in the wild. Something like the Brussels sprouts, they weren't actually discovered. They were invented through centuries of selective breeding from wild mustard plants. Things like cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, kale, Brussels sprouts all came from the exact same plant species. That is insane. It's the same species, but it's able to output so many different unique foods. All of these extremely common vegetables, well, plants really, only ever existed because of the human intervention to the wild mustard plant, all taking place roughly 3,000 years ago. That's when it's estimated that we first started manipulating the wild mustard plant somewhere in Northern Europe. The Brussels sprout was actually the latest of the mutations that we selectively bred for, and the first was cabbage, which also comes from the wild mustard plant. All of this taking place, again, 3,000 years ago. It's not just one or two plants, or, or one or two foods or fruits. It's a lot of them. In fact, there is a list of just the ones that I've been able to find in a little bit of research. Bananas, corn, oranges, lemons, seedless grapes, seedless watermelons, modern strawberries, pineapple, broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, blueberries, blackberries, raspberries, Brussels sprouts, kohlrabi, I don't even know what this is, wheat, rice, and any seedless citrus. Not a single one of these exists in the wild, even in a remotely similar form to the form that you would see at a local grocery store. It's kind of wild to think about, right? Like so many foods that we use in, or that we used to see as natural are actually like long-term human experiments that have worked out really, really well for us and really, really well for the plants. After all, how much corn is growing right now because of us? Things we grow, eat, and enjoy every single day, none of them could have survived without us. And in a weird way, it makes it kind of part of our shared history. Every bite is a little piece of thousands of years of selective choice. So next time you're eating something simple like broccoli or banana, or maybe potentially avoiding those two, right? It's ours. We made this. If you found that as interesting as I did, hit the like button, subscribe. It would totally free to you and it would help me out immensely. Go ahead and write a comment for the sake of engagement. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.